<coughs> this is a, a, a fraction of work that I've been doing for a long time and just get myself, as my wife would say, just sit down and finish your book. I've been traveling a lot. Ironically, I was in Florida and I didn't go there. And just came from the conference, and I just lived on good time before the storm hit. Very fortunate. So, the idea of uh, understanding reality, which is really in the core of what gifts are trying to share with us and how to bring us to understand. Can you hear me in the back? Would you like to talk a little louder? <coughs> please? Thank you. I'm also fighting allergy, so I hope that I can project the sound. But little mind, if I slow down all of my sound very weak, just no, just tell me. <clears throat> uh, I have major three points that I would like to cover, uh, and I hope that I have the time to do that. Uh, what I'm trying to do, like what John did, is always complex situation that you have to really take your time to explain. So I'm hoping that I can cover the three items or sub-topics, uh, Gibson, they found perception and civicism. And the second one is arguing that what we perceive and we call absolute reality is becoming obsolete. And the third one, evolution of love and the respectable uh, consciousness of how this really connect together. There is subtopics under the subtopics, but we, we will, we will uh, go further. <coughs> so, interestingly, Gibson's notion of diverse perception echoes Peirce's doctrine of cynicism. If you are not familiar with Gibson, with uh, Peirce's idea, Cynicism is continuity. Uh, I have to warn you, get uh, persons use very interesting words and vocabulary that is can be a turn off, as I witnessed in doing my doctoral dissertation many years ago. But <clears throat> there is an assumption that people think that they find this perception does not go through, and I, I I like what you did, John, about the uh, visual that you shared with us. And in fact, what I think uh, Gibson and, and Pierce almost like grow up in one place. And I know Gibson was like nine years old when Pierce dies in 1914. But here is something that, that might be very interesting for us. And it's really uh, complementary to what you have done, John. Thank you. The whole idea about different structure, they're actually transparent, that we can go through back and forth. And I know that we have almost a linear fashion here, but it's actually a it, it, it complete circle. I couldn't do it in, in what I'm having here. But why? This is really coming from very strong explanation of what per se sign or semiosis. And again, taking the risk of uh, getting uh, into a lot of terminologies, a sign, a sign has three legs or elements. One, we call it representima or sign, and the other leg is object, and the other one is interpreter. So we have three elements. But this, what, what this is really sharing with us is an incredible opportunity that nothing is staying static and it changed. It's a constant evolve, thoughts, ideas. So what's interesting here that the interpretant, which has been called the locus of interpretation, is going back and forth. The interpretant is really create a new sign, and hence the new sign create a new interpretant and a new object, and it goes on in phantom. What I have here on the left side is a typical 
based on uh, another of uh, semiotic process, what Pierce is saying, semiotic science, and I applied that to Gibson's idea about the five modes of the structure, uh, consciousness structure. So this is, uh, and, and trust me, I'm starting with theoretical background, but I'll get into the ground. I'll talk about something that's very concrete. <clears throat> so, one of the things that, that, that is fascinating, that a perspective, a perspectival uh, way of thinking, well, someone was talking about uh, the perspective. Ironically, why, why emerge into one vanishing point is focusing on one point, one point, but it, it loses the rest. And you talked about that a lot, so I'm not going to ex explore more of that. <coughs> So, before I get further, Gibson has a wonderful line that calling it uh, absolute coming from the Latin word absolutum, which ironically to push away and separate. My Christian Orthodox Coptic people uh, in Egypt, which I was born a long time ago, they told us Jesus Christ in my heart. The problem is, how could I have God or goddess in my heart and yet call that goddess and God absolute and push away? How ironic and how uh, doesn't make any sense. Even God and goddess are not absolute. And I'm putting my neck on the line here. The philosopher who argued since 18th, 17th century, the absoluteness. Nothing in life that is absolute. I am convinced that I wish I had known that long time ago. Nothing is absolute. Nothing. Even God or God or whatever you want to call it. So the problem is, <coughs> I'm not necessarily going to read, but you can read on the slide and I'm just going to read. The problem, the main problem, about absoluteness is the confusion that our two items here, what we call real and true. There is a confusion about what's real and what's true. Why are we dividing this for now? Because I'm going to come into something else later. What is real we can change. What's true we cannot change. Even how they change or the sun coming on a wall way to peace and holy quest. And that's why religious people can fight. Because everyone thinks that God is absolute God and the other is not. Judo Christian tradition, Islam, etc. etc. <coughs> Another thing about what's true and what's real. The true always describe what exists. Describe, the operative word, describe. The real, describe. There is a difference between describe and describe. When I am describing something, I'm talking about what already exists. When I am describing something, I am talking about that which yet to come. A side note, we cannot resist because most of us watching what's happening in political arena and just very depressing. People who deal with reality as true reality, debate and debate about the status quo. People who put implicit in creating different reality, the engage in dialogue and create that which is not, it doesn't exist. Debate in itself does not take me anywhere. Dialogue does. So when we say, for look, wait a minute, how could I get away from debate? Debate, but don't stay there. I have a line that I've been sharing with my graduate students. 
Let's put this line this. Meet people where people are and don't stay there. <laughs> because if you stay there, you are not going to go anywhere. Meet people where people are and don't stay there. This is my model in design. So when people, some people talk about the truth, I don't know what the truth is. I'm coming to something at the end, if there with me. <coughs> so what you say, could you give an example of what, what real and the truth is? Have you met, how many of you have been in uh, the gambling place? I went once, <laughs> my wife and sister. He said, you must come for the first day. <laughs> for your first day, I did. German background, you don't want to argue with my wife. <laughs> I said, yes. I don't argue with anybody. So. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to uh, Las Vegas, which was really annoying to me, but I pretend that I'm very happy. <laughs> Do you love it, honey? Yes, ma'am. It's lovely. <laughs> the stints and the pyramid. They would say that the pyramid and the sphinx in the sphinx is real, but the truth is the sphinx and the pyramid of Giza in Egypt. Now someone will say, wait a minute, there is sometimes the real and the true can be isomorphic, and that's my biggest dilemma. I had to divide the two for now. The trick. I apologize. But the real and the true can be isomorphic. And I have a line just uh, came in at the Semiotic Site of America. And I called the presentation Telling the Truth by Lying. And yes, John, we all lie. Sometimes we don't know, but we all lie. <laughs> So watch this. Many years ago, as a child, I saw the Abu Simbel Kimball, or Ramses II Kimball. Some of you heard or read or have been there. This is the original uh, location, which is the true location. And the one that they actually, UNESCO took it out and built it on the top of the hill, so it would avoid Lake Nasser devastation and the water. True and real. The same building. I kid you not, when I visited the new temple after the being raised on the top, there is something visceral, not the same. There is just a feeling that it is not it was not the same when I saw the temple before. <coughs> We have always seen this in the sense of the Valley, resistance of memory. He challenged us, scholars and philosophers, that what we see and divide space and time, past, present, and future, is illusion. And they try to communicate to us through that. Some of us got it. And some of us got lost in the classical philosophy. And by the way, it kills me, absolutely kills me. When we talk about philosophy, the love of wisdom as being invented in Greece. And Jason, if you decide to write a book, I would love to have an invitation from you <laughs> to talk about the chapter before philosophy, when the notion of wisdom, not philosophy, but of wisdom that's really initiated in Egypt, but because Egypt was conquered by Arab and Muslim in 641 AD, it's becoming a Muslim country. I'm mean, one of the people who lived in Egypt because I could not survive there. As Coptic Christians, they could not be there. Philosophy has its roots in ancient Egypt, not Egypt of today. 
Plato says that about what he reads. Yeah. The other thing, another painting by Rene Marguerite, and you see a woman on a horse, and you see the space, you see the empty space in front of the horse, and you, you challenge yourself, what am I looking at? Again, uh, without elaborating too much on this, painters, artists, trying to tell us something, but we keep living in our head, sleeping off. Ancient Egyptians told us that the intelligence is not in the brain. They took everything out of the body. Everything. Even the brain was sucked out of the nose. And after lunch is okay. <laughs> okay. They even sucked the brain out of the nose. And only one thing left inside is the heart. We have a beautiful term that they call it, translated into English, the intelligence of the heart. That's why I am such a full of that is that's probably the only truth that we have. <coughs> if reality always true, Christopher Columbus will, will will just fall off of the edge of the earth. Back in time, they told people, the earth is flat. You cannot go beyond Orcas Island, I'm just saying. You're going to fall off the edge. Christopher Columbus did not believe. He saw different reality. Whether it was good or bad, that's a different story. Only the imaginary can link what's true and what's real. And this is in semiotic tradition, the mediation. When you did your example of how you connect, that took imagination to actually perceive that. The true and the real can only connect or be connected by the imaginary. I love there is a, a line, a line that I just remember. Are you familiar with uh, um, the psychologist uh, who wrote the book? The thought of the heart and the soul of the world. James Hellman. Jim Hellman. Love the uh, phrase he has. Just the, he says, go there. When we fall in love, we begin to imagine. And when we begin to imagine, we fall in love. The imaginary is always attached to love and desire. Have you forgotten the idea of going on a, a date with your handsome guy and beautiful girl? <laughs> You imagine it before it happened, but it didn't. Really. Some of us, some of us have actually imagined more than that. So, the imaginary ties to what I call diaphanous perception and polychronic time. I made this up. I borrowed some from Edward Hall. The term polychronic time. Is actually borrowed from uh, Edward Hall, who wrote Beyond Culture, etc., etc., Silent Language. And of course, my friend's conception is our beloved Gibson. I just love Gibson. Thank God we have Gibson. There's a lot of things that we would have been lost forever. So when you look at the prehistoric carving of ancient Egyptians, some of us thought these are record of the past. That's absolutely not true. It doesn't make any sense. These people imagine the future by being there and at the point. As I used to call this locating imagination, and I, I would invention into a whole different story. Uh, 
that is the, when you design, you repeat, you begin to externalize that which the language was all about to describe. In fact, by repeating, you can linguistify what you're thinking about. Repeating imagination is about being able to go beyond space and time, time free, space free, reality. Someone would say, wait a minute, how, how literally could you navigate in diaphragmatic space and polychronic time? It's, still, it's very easy to trick the mind and deceive or seduce the heart. And by the way, I'm use the word, using the word seduce or seduction in a whole different way than the dictionary. By the, by the way, seduce isn't like here in German language. So, the seduce is to lead, not to be astray, but to lead forward, to lead in a good sense. Purpose. Henry Bergeson was very helpful for me. He's saying that memory is not about what's real or what is imaginary. Bergeson was saying that there is two different kinds of memories, and I mean, using his language differently. Past memory and future memory. Another thing is split here for you that you would love. A lot to split here between words and language. Love it. Absolutely love it. They actually describe visualization as imagination. Yes. No. Visualization is different than imagination. When I visualize something, I'm recalling something from the past. When I am imagining something, is about something yet to come. But there is a pretty thing here, again, the isomorphic. If I am not good in visualization, I cannot do good job in imagination. It's like you're training yourself for basketball. You jog, and you get into the game to play the game. Play the game. There is a difference. If that's the case, if what I'm saying makes any sense to anyone, then it is easily possible to remember things from the, from the future, not just the past. Present reality, as we know it, has been constructed by past memory. Future can only be actualized by future memory. You see the difference between the two? And now I'm, I'm moving to the third. I'm, I'm really moving fast, and I'm not even reading my note. I just got the hint from John. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. So it doesn't matter what's, what I have written. There's stuff on the slides that you can read, and I feel a lot better mimic what John did, thanks. The issue of hope, I love what you said. There is a hole in the hole, a hole H in the hole, WH hole in. And it's coming from a very interesting phenomenon. And it's a periodic phenomenon that is, we are, as humans, we are in condition of incompleteness. There is no whole autonomous by itself. That's why I decided to give Sabrina the $35 to be part of your community. What a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not leaving this place. I'm going to be following you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> And because we are aware of our condition of incompleteness, we recognize this incompleteness. And as a result, we have desire. Notice the word the desire. Desire for overcome incompleteness. By the way, the word the desire and the word the design, ironically coming together from desirata. Desire and design. I'm not talking about designing home or building or chair. It's not a relationship. 
But here is the dilemma. Here is the paradox of life which John also hinted at. There is no whole that is complete and done. Every time we connect with a larger whole, we cannot just go home and rest and say, I have done it, I have done it, rest. It shifts on you because whole is never static and never complete. And it goes on and on infinitely. It's why we fall in love. It's why we have friendship. It's why we have community. It's why we live, why we have nation. It's why we have earth. The desire, and I call it the desperate desire to connect with the larger home. Because it's, it never finished, it never done. And it is wonderful and delicious. Can you imagine if you fall in love one time and that's it? Have you heard about, I have my first love and there, is, there will be no other love except this love? No. No. It's a constant process. We never hope. We never complete hope. The dictionary, love. Complete, the first thing you see, Complete is com whole is complete. When dictionary, no, whole is never complete. Folks, if whole is complete, it will be a dead whole, not a life whole. A dead whole, this is a life whole. So this this phenomenon that that. The desire for wholeness, which I was embarrassed many, many years ago. I was giving a lecture in Antioch University, and I came up with the term homophilia. I was embarrassed. I was shy about it. There is nothing in English language that I can seek that combine the word love and the word whole. So I made my own words. We talked yesterday about the problem of using the language which controls the way we think and the way we act. But this is very interesting phenomena too. That sense of wholeness or the love of wholeness, it's not, again, as I said, it's not complete. And it has very interesting situation here that is becoming a prerequisite for engaging in love for creation. And also the manifestation of love, showing granddaughter. I could sense that, John. I'm focusing on you because you came in front of me. There is a reason for it. I have two. One is six and one just three. That's wonderful. So whatever we do in life, if if we do it out of love of creation, it is also a manifestation of what we do. So there is a two-way street. I cannot say that I will do something teaching or designing or whatever that I don't like, even gardening, which I love to do. I like to have my hand in the dirt. Yes, we hang in here with gods and God in the sky, but they're also touching the soil, mm -hmm. and I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot, except I cannot fight the tears and work assignment. We have no predators. So we share food. Except for fences. And I don't like to kill them, because I don't <coughs> necessarily enjoy eating meat. But why evolutionary love? What? What love got to do with it? <laughs> what my 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 love, my God? I was stunned by the word "no" and "love." It's actually in the Bible. Yes. To know the man or the woman you love, it means to be in love with. To know and to love, they are the same word, the same meaning. So why academia does not talk about love? No, it's not very scholarly. If 
Farouk. We don't talk about love. This is wishy, wishy, wishy stuff. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, if we know how to engage in love, we expand our knowledge and our intelligence. To know is to love. To know is to love. This is, as I said, using, using a lot of terminology that can be very difficult. But it, not, no, no misspelling here. That's the way he used agabism from agabi, agabism. And he's saying evolutionary love, love or agabastic evolution is more than evolution by chance or evolution by mechanical necessity. Love cannot be by necessity. It has to be by desire. And this is saying agabastic evolution include the other two. You see, he said, he tells us there is no fine line between the three. They all connect. But agabastic love is much higher and in canvas or in globe, the other kind of evolution in the world. Wait, it's going to be very interesting again. How much time do I have here? You see, I have to say something else here. One of my weakness in life, you ask the shit, my wife. When I love something, I forget. I could sit and work and write for hours until I cannot get up from my chair because I have my blood and smoke. <laughs> there is a reason I'm saying that. Not to remind you that you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> the reason is, just as they were talking about power and strength, was, I think it was... Uh, early uh, presentation. Within the thing that we are passionate about and love beside our weakness and wise soul. Have you driven fast lately? You drive fast and the blind spot would be bigger. You slow down and the blind spot shrink. And so many of us around one of these people we don't know our blind spot until a friend or a dear family member say, Farouk, have you seen such and such? So you need to help each other by pointing the blind spot. And I hope you do that for me. So what, what we're talking about love a lot. And here is another dilemma for me. People associating love or errors with love as some kind of erotic phenomenon. It's not. It's not. There are four different kinds of love, and I'm building this for myself and uh, the classical philosophy. There is agave, you know, the love of humanity to God or God to humanity. There is philia, the love of brotherhood, sisterhood. The Vigo, that's rampant in our internet. And there is amor. You know, amor being in love, being in the romantic. Eros is not one kind of love. Eros is the trigger of all love, all kinds of love. And you see, this is really what it, it drove me nuts back when I was in Abakhemia. I wish I had known that. Yes, and I would have saved myself from a lot of problems. There is no one love completely devoid of the other three. Even in the Bible, Christ is the root, the church is the root. There are a lot of, a lot of things in the Bible also, Old Testament and the New Testament, talking about the the love between God and humans, almost to, and I can use the word erotic, but not the erotic that we have been exposed to in modern time. Erotica is different. 
than tomography. Erotica has not something to do with love, not tomography. If that's the case, and if love is all, eros is the trigger of all kind of love, then we must, or I have no choice but to call eros the generator of desire. G-O-D for short. <laughs> I am not saying something different than we all know, but beginning to, to just pose things for us to see that love is not something so simple or so unacademic or whatever the case is. It's real. It's real. And I'm talking about creative love in the in the line of what persons call evolutionary love. Mm. And I'm going to end here because I would love to have conversation. There is a lot. I have pages and pages here that I did not read a word. You're a troublemaker, John. You let me do it. But I would leave time to discuss. By integrating a perspectival consciousness and evolution of love has the potential, this has the potential to liberate, to liberate human beings from the current limitations of the present and dogmatic nationalistic ideology. Acquiring Diophanus perception and deep understanding of cynicism continuity, reveal the ever-present and reciprocal relation, relationship between culture and nature, and therefore stimulate cultural sensitivity and environmental sensibility. Nature and human nature are not different. It's not duality. Nature and human nature are one, we just have forgotten that. In fact, we were born with it, but we have forgotten. Such is the insight into nature and human nature. Thank you. Mentioned, or I don't know what this was on your slide. Uh, you said that on the slide was written, transparency is at the heart of the Hungarian being in the world, just fine. So, could you explain that? Because I found that, I find that completely fascinating. Transparency? You said transparency? You said transparency is at the heart of the Hungarian just fine. Oh, oh, thank you. I missed that completely, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I love the notion, uh, the notion is called being in the world, uh, being in the world. And Gibson would say being present or present. What does it mean to be present? What does it mean to be in the world? Being in the world is not static. We all talk about things like that. Being in the world, being able to transfer over time and space and come back. When I use the future, future memory exercise with graduate students who were writing master thesis or uh, dissertation, I have a process that I call conceptualization process. I use language and I bring the language into uh, qualities, adverb, adjectives, and reconstruct again phrases and often you end up with the notion or a question that take their uh, Inquiry or research, for, it, it's a long process, and I wouldn't it, it would take hours actually. So, being in the world is being able to navigate by fast space and polychronic time. That's what I'm just going to say. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love it. I love it too. <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of love? <laughs> <laughs> Here's my answer. 
<laughs> so thank you, Lisa, for reminding me because that's a very important piece. So, <coughs> two small comments, uh, both appreciative. Uh, the first, about Hearst and the three evolutionary distinctions you make. Hearst um, takes those from Schelling, and considered himself a Schellingian. Um, so that's uh, another interlocutor for your project. Uh, he told William James that if he would be considered as a Schelling of updated physics, that would be fine, is what he is. Um, so another plea for the Gibsarian element of Schelling. And then on your love, talk, talking about love and philosophy, why there's no philosophy of love, I was reminded immediately of one of the most beautiful lines in all of Nietzsche's philosophy. He really is a diaphanous appropriation of Western thought into his net context. And he says, well, the love of wisdom, if you think all the way through, is the wisdom of love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh,
of America next year is going to meet in Kuahua, Mexico. Mm -hmm. just came from there three weeks ago. Lovely. It's a lovely, wonderful city. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. city. It's not Mexico City. It's about two hour drive from Mexico City. Anyway, so another reason to go to Kuahua. We'll talk more about that. Well, we're running 10 minutes late, so oh. from that perspective, we're exactly on time. <laughs> <laughs> we started at group about 10 minutes late. Um, so we come upon our, our next talk, Susan Neville, who I think has my vote for 